Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great honor and deepest trepidation that I introduce to you all the inaugural episode of the Garot Podcast. As a matter of housekeeping, I am sure the first question on everyone's mind is, what is a garot? It is an understandable question, because it is not a word that common English parlance retains in our era. However, at this beginning, I do believe it pertinent to address this question, because I think the definition of the term garot is very representative of what you, the audience, can expect from this podcast. In its simplest definition, a garot is a method of execution dating back to antiquity, specifically by strangulation. Later, the term came to be associated with the device that carried out this method of death by strangulation. When referring to the device itself, the word garot can simply mean a piece of wire attached to a pair of wooden handles at either end. In later iterations, as technology progressed, the strangulation device became affixed to an upright wooden bench with a tourniquet-like gear and pulley system installed at the back of the headrest. The advantage of this design, if we permit ourselves to use such a term in this context, was that it freed the executioner from having to exert any of his own bodily energy, because the cranking gears provided the required force on the constriction strap wrapped around the neck of the condemned. What was particularly gruesome about this later design was the fact that death was not at all swift. The garrote would often require several rotations of the crank before the onset of sufficient constriction to block the air passage would occur. This image of gradual strangulation by mechanics beyond the helpless individual's control, while undeniably morbid, is a perfect metaphor for the conditions under which this podcast has even come into existence. Functionally, the creation of this podcast is an act of desperation. The power of the metaphor behind the garrote is such that it can explain, albeit in a rather macabre fashion, the nature of this desperation. That is what I would like to speak about in this first episode of the podcast. I hope that, by the end of this episode, you, the audience, will be able to have a clearer understanding of the nature of this desperation, why this desperation exists, and how that desperation will inform the entirety of this first season. My co-host, who you all will be meeting in the next episode, coined the phrase farting into the microphone to describe the state of many widely popular podcasts. To be sure, it is a phrase that is as crass as it is juvenile. However, it is a phrase that I nevertheless fully endorse because of how many ideas it can capture within a very few choice words. Now, this might strike you, the audience, as somewhat peculiar. What does a sarcastic commentary on podcasting have to do with the desperation I just previously mentioned? The answer to this question lies in the juxtaposition between two different yet coexisting sets of circumstances. On the one hand, long-form podcasting as an entertainment medium has exploded in popularity and relevance over the past decade. One need look no further than the pioneering example of Joe Rogan and his legacy media divorced ascent to mass awareness to demonstrate this point. This new medium experienced such a meteoric rise because, in large part, the content production demands of the format are very simple, i.e., turning on a microphone and talking for however long it pleases the individual, which in turn allows for large volumes of rapid output. What this creates, however, is a frequently recurring quality control problem, in which ideas requiring succinct and systematic articulation are buried in a large swath of tangential rambling. Granted, there do indeed exist masters of articulation who are able to use speech to consistently generate dense, high-quality content. However, taken as a whole, these intellectual luminaries occupy a minority share of the general long-form podcasting sphere. Now, to be fair, this kind of linguistic imprecision is not necessarily a problem in and of itself. Ideas and communication naturally evolve 
along these improvisationally negotiated lines, giving rise to common references and informal memes, in the Richard Dawkins sense of the term, that serve as common use tools by which multiple individuals can construct positions that can interact on common ground, even if those positions don't necessarily agree upon every point. However, in a situation where these common references are no longer available, let's say, for example, when a new participant who was not privy to what previous conversations had already established suddenly enters the scene, the need for precision of language exponentially increases because the content of the exchange has to carry all the weight of the concepts required to address whatever the given issue at hand is. This brings us directly to the other end of the juxtaposition, namely, the function of high register speech patterns and the power of the written word. I realize that, at first glance, these might appear to be intangible abstractions, but allow me to explain. Complicated and contentious subjects always prioritize the written form over the oral form. Whether it be scientists trying to explain a complex finding, or bickering couples who, having lost all ability to speak to one another, are reduced by necessity to exchanging strictly written correspondence, the written word enables the individual to use paper as a tool to capture all relevant information. Contained, systematic, organized, and succinct. All in a single location, with no further references required beyond what is already provided on the page. This is the central logic behind what impels authors to create books. When committed to writing, ideas can easily stand as independent and self-contained units that are readily transferable between individuals. This logic ought to be self-evident. However, what is certainly not obvious is the astronomical amount of resources required to articulate knowledge and information into this kind of highly portable format. Do these descriptions seem odd and abstract to you? Don't worry. Prepare to get inundated with a deluge of this kind of talk in the upcoming episodes. But my compact with you, the listener, will always be to explain myself as clearly as possible along the way. Essentially, what I am trying to express is a very basic idea, and the idea is simply this. Writing is incredibly hard work, particularly when the objective is to do it well and properly. Anyone who has ever attempted to properly complete a writing project understands this truth. The amount of time and energy required to create a high-quality piece of writing is simply gargantuan, but more importantly, I'm spending so much time bemoaning this fact because it is exactly high-quality writing that could solve many of the problems associated with farting into the microphone. To be sure, there do exist towering examples who are able to create written work that provides substantively deep conclusions on unfathomably complex topics, conclusions so decisive they are practically syllogistic in strength. But herein lies the conundrum. Both my co-host and I are writers by craft. Writing defines so much of what we do. However, our income generation, the employment we take to feed ourselves and keep the lights on, is wholly divorced from our writing work, which in turn creates a terrible situation. For more than 40 hours per week, my co-host and I slave away at dead-end jobs we would both abandon in a heartbeat if we did not have to worry about losing the roofs over our heads. To make matters even worse, we belong to a generation doomed to make its way in a world that is already in the process of disillusion. Widespread economic hardship on its own is indeed burdensome, but not insurmountable. However, what we are witnessing now is the breakdown of the ability for humans to interact with one another because there are ideas taking root in the collective consciousness of humanity that actively prevent the old modes of agreeing to disagree and going your separate ways from being viable options anymore. Both inside and outside the Western world, humanity is witnessing 
increasing crackdowns on freedom of thought and expression, the likes of which have not been seen since the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union at a very minimum. Despite Dave Ramsey's platitudes about the perennial 12% growth of the stock market, the fear of uncertain finances coupled with the fear of violent retribution for voicing a wrong opinion, i.e. thought crime, is a combination that Western baby boomers are largely incapable of addressing. Now, like I was saying just a minute ago, an antidote for breaking this unholy duo could easily be high-quality writing. The written word has always been a bane for pathological ideas, because ink and paper are the great exposers of babbling hysterics and all other forms of aberrant nonsense. Remember the antique adage about plans or ideas only working on paper, but are ultimately impractical? Embedded within this nugget of wisdom is the corollary that states, if something does not even work on paper to begin with, the concept in question is damned from the beginning. No legitimate rocket scientist says, the math doesn't work at all, and none of the equations balance, but let's just shoot the rocket up anyways and see what happens. When taken at face value, I know that what I'm about to say sounds incredibly naive. However, high quality writing could solve so many of the social ills we observe in the world today because it gives individuals something tangible to grasp onto and combat the pathology that consumes both them and their surroundings. Have you ever noticed that this is the reason why, for better or worse, the seminal books and documents are what tend to bring about massive paradigm shifts? Think Martin Luther's 95 Theses, the Declaration of Independence, or even Mein Kampf of the Communist Manifesto. This is exactly the logic behind yet another worn-out adage that states, the pen is mightier than the sword. At this juncture, I want to pause for a moment and make sure that you're still paying attention. Are you beginning to see how everything I'm saying is coming together? If I could, I would spend all day, every day, pumping out syllogism after syllogism to combat the thought poison that is infecting my family, my loved ones, and is running rampant through my community with no less virulence than an infectious disease. But I can't. My knowledge is not organized. The support and reasons for my ideas and positions exist, but in disorganized piles that need restructuring before they can withstand combative debate. And yet, I clock in my 40 plus hours per week just to ensure basic living expenses are covered. But the consequence of ignoring these problems is that I will be crushed under the iron heel of pathological ideas when the time comes that I require my syllogisms and they are not there. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the very nature of the garrote and its appropriateness as a metaphor. Ask yourselves this question. If it was your neck in the garrote and the crank was slowly beginning to turn, what would you say before the ability to speak was completely taken from you? For myself, this podcast is an attempt to answer that question. As a writer, I have purposefully avoided social media over the past decade because my rebukes against what I saw and indeed still see to be problematic were never sufficiently brought to complete form. However, I believe the time has come that I can no longer continue to wait. So, what does this mean for all of you listening in? To begin with, I want to thank you all, wherever and whomever you may be, for investigating this dark rabbit hole. My ideas are usually met with only apathy, and the value of your curiosity cannot be understated. As such, my pledge to you will be to do my utmost to avoid the problem of farting into the microphone. The way I intend to fulfill that pledge 
may be described as follows. Although I do not have refined syllogisms to present to you from the outset, the ideas I have to offer are nevertheless tangible. Over the years of our friendship, my co-host and I have developed a growing lexicon of shorthand terms that function as tools to efficiently diagnose and counteract pathological ideas by addressing key background and often recurrent mechanisms. Over time, these terms have taken on a life of their own, sort of like memes that only really exist between the two of us. Regardless, these pseudo-memes, if I may indulge myself usage of the term, are based upon very real and articulatable axioms that lurk beneath the surface. This catalog, this toolkit, if you will, is what I hope to share with you all in this first season of this podcast. From the perspective of a writer, the content of this podcast very naturally progresses into a high-quality curated release, comparable, in my mind, to any of Plato's dialogues. Indeed, if I'm perfectly honest, that was the original intention behind the vast majority of this content, because these meme tools are originally supposed to be mere stepping stones to a greater set of expositions and conclusions. Perhaps, at some future date, such a release can still occur. However, as the constriction of the garrote is closing in, this will perhaps have to suffice as the best I can muster for now. I want to conclude this episode with a reference to Eric Weinstein, another one of those intellectual titans who, in fact, is the godfather behind the creation of the intellectual dark web. In the absence of syllogisms, ideas and positions do not elegantly defend themselves, which means that those who utter them are particularly susceptible to attack. One need look no further than the example of legacy media organizations attempting to smear Joe Rogan as an alt-right homophobe. But, just as Eric Weinstein pointed out, legacy media failed to realize that millions of people, the very individuals in whose eyes they attempted to smear Joe Rogan, had functionally spent thousands of hours hanging out with him in his parlor. Long-form podcasting allowed Mr. Rogan to demonstrate his credibility to millions of people, even in the face of insufficiently precise speech upon which bad faith actors were attempting to capitalize. So, in that vein, I would like to invite you all to come hang out in the sense to which Eric Weinstein referred. Perhaps, in spite of the adversity that seeks to constrict us and deprive us of life, literal or metaphorical, we may find the very tools that will free us, so that we may one day at last leave behind this wretched device. So, until next time. Vidorigo Speranto. Keep breathing, everyone.